Well, good morning, church. Hey, God bless you. Hey, happy 4th of July weekend. See, that was a low woo because the rest of you are probably like me where you're not off on Monday, so you got nothing better to do. She might as well come into the presence of God, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, hey, listen, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're hungry. I'm glad that you're seeking. We have been in a Bible study series in the book of Acts, and Acts is a powerful book because it was the model of how God launched the church here on this earth. God gave us a task. We preached about that last week. All of us have been called to the Great Commission. God has called every single one of us. I don't know what his individual plan is for your life, but he's called every single one of us to preach the gospel unapologetically. He's anointed you, he's equipped you, he's empowered you, he's called you. And today we continue in in our Bible study and we're in Acts chapter 10, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm gonna summarize a little bit of what happened until we get to our main verses, but Acts chapter 10 is a pivotal chapter. For those of you who've grown up in the church, you've been here a while, you understand Acts chapter 10 is about Cornelius and his family coming to the faith. But what's more important about that is this. This chapter takes place 10 years after the day of Pentecost. The gospel has been on preach, the gospel has gone out, signs, wonders, and miracles have taken place. But up until this point, Gentiles, non-Jewish believing, non-Jews have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this chapter, God begins to work on the heart of Peter and begins to transform some of his religious practices or his thoughts or his perception or his prejudice towards non-Jews. And he begins to bring the gospel message to them. Can you imagine that? For 10 years, 10 years, heaven and hell have been preached. The realities of eternity have been preached. The anointing of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. Signs, wonders, and miracles were happening. But the early church did not bring the gospel message to anybody who wasn't Jewish. You see, God still had to work on his church And that's where we pick up today. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit working in Saul's life in Acts chapter 9 and the Holy Spirit beginning to work in Peter's life, Acts chapter 10, the church of Jesus Christ would not be here today. So if you have your Bibles or you have your uh, phone, you can turn into your notes. You can look on the screen. Today we're picking up Acts chapter 10, starting with verse 44. Now, everything before that is what I just summarized. God speaks to Peter. He gives him a dream. Peter doesn't understand the dream. And he says, Lord, I've never eaten those things. Those would make me defiled as a Jew. I've never done those things. I've never broken your law. I haven't done that. And God says, do not call unclean what I've made clean. In other words, do not look down on these people. Do not have prejudice. Do not look at these things and call them dirty when I've called you to it. And Peter, not understanding this, I love this. He, he gets a, a visitor, some visitors that say, hey, Cornelius had a dream. An angel spoke to them. He sent us to this house. He said there was a man named Peter. Peter was having a dream, and he'd have a message for Cornelius' house. So we've come to get you. And Peter, he's, he's funny. He arrives at Cornelius' house, and he says, you know, you know, by the way, by the way, Cornelius, it's not customary for a Jew to sit with Gentiles. Basically, he was saying, you know, I'm breaking God's law. I've never sat with you before. I've never sat with people like you before. I've, I've never come and entertained or broke bread or had meals. And could you imagine that today? That would be like us going into the city of Philadelphia to a gospel preaching, uh, uh, multicultural church, and you say, you know what? I've only sat in white churches. I've never sat with you before. That wouldn't go so well. But Peter put his, his foot in his mouth, and he said that anyway. But despite that, he begins to preach the gospel, and the Holy Spirit falls. That brings us to Acts chapter 10, verse 44. It says this, while Peter was still speaking these words, so while he was still preaching and teaching about Jesus Christ, it says that the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and declaring the greatness of God. 
Today, church, I want to talk to you about the baptism and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And as today we begin this study at a historical context and begin teaching it, I want to encourage you that do not let past thoughts, past experiences, past circumstances block what God has for you. The Holy Spirit, as we see in this chapter, is for every single person. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for today. God, I thank you that you are the same God. I thank you that you still move in signs, wonders, and miracles, God. I thank you that you don't favor specific groups of people over others, but God, you brought the gospel to all. The Holy Spirit was poured out on all. It was confirmation that Jesus, eternity and heaven and forgiveness of sin is for everybody. So Lord, as we dive deep into your word today, I pray that you would remove prejudiced thoughts. God, I pray that you would remove barriers that would stop the gospel from going forward. God, I pray for those who have had negative experiences when it comes to the Holy Spirit. God, soften their hearts today to receive all that you have for them. We pray this in the mighty name and power of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. I want to turn your attention that in the verses that we just read, the phrase was used that the Holy Spirit came down. The Holy Spirit came down. This is important because it shows that the Holy Spirit was the initiator. He was the one. Cornelius in his house, they didn't have to prepare a special service. They didn't have to present a a special offering. They didn't have to do anything special. They weren't fasting. They weren't doing any of that stuff. But as Peter preached, as Peter preached, as Peter was faithful to what God called him to do, the Holy Spirit came down in the middle of his message. I I wonder in in church today what would happen if we had pastors preaching and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit broke out in the middle of the message. We're not following the church format like we should be. I didn't get to my three points. I didn't get to my application. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit broke out in the midst of preaching. And everybody began speaking The Bible says in tongues, but today I want to use this. They began speaking in their heavenly language. It broke out. It looked like to the natural eye, what a disruption. What a commotion. The pastor's not able to finish. Peter's not able to finish his message. But God had an agenda. And Peter was open and obedient. You see, God was not only moving on Cornelius' house, he was moving on Peter's heart to understand that the gospel and the Holy Spirit is for everyone. So Cornelius didn't do anything special, but this is what he did do. This is what the Bible teaches. He prepared himself to receive whatever God had for him. Acts chapter 10, verse 33 says, so immediately I sent for you, meaning Cornelius is speaking to Peter. Immediately I sent for you, and it was good for you to come. So now we have, are all gathered in the presence of God here to receive everything the Lord had commanded. Cornelius sent for Peter. He gathered, he gathered his whole household. They were ready to receive whatever the Lord wanted to bring. Cornelius positioned himself. He was waiting in expectation. He did only what he could do by preparing his heart and his family, but he trusted God to do what only the Lord could do by sending his message. So today, church family, I want to help you receive whatever the Lord has for you today. Whatever God has for you today in the service, in the scriptures, I want to help you to receive and prepare for what Jesus has. In the Old Testament, there were specific times that the Holy Spirit would pour out in powerful demonstrations. This concept of the Holy Spirit isn't something new to the New Testament. We see that he was present even in Genesis at the start of creation. It said that the Spirit of God, he hovered over the waters. The Spirit of God was present, and it said that it was dark. I want you to hear this, church. The Spirit of God was present. He was present in the midst of darkness. It doesn't matter how dark things get in this world. It doesn't matter what is happening in this world. The Holy Spirit is present. (laughs) 
I love how the Bible teaches that, and unless you study the original Hebrew text, we miss this in the English translation, but really what the scriptures were saying was that in that time, Satan was cast out of the heavens. He was in darkness. Basically, he was saying the spirit of God hovered over. He was above the realm of darkness where Satan resided, where Satan had control, where Satan had authority. The spirit of God was above the work of Satan. And he's still in control today. We see other examples in the Old Testament where God supernaturally empowered people. We, I can think of Moses was supernaturally empowered by the Lord to carry out his great purpose. We know that he was sent to Egypt and he performed signs and wonders to set his people free. But in Numbers chapter 11, verse 16 through 17, Moses has been walking with the nation of Israel for a time. He's been leading the people. They've had great moments where God shows up and supernaturally saves them, redeems them, empowers them. But they've also had critically low moments. And Moses, in this moment, is facing a low time. I imagine that the nation of Israel, he just felt the pressure. And actually, it says that. He feels the pressure of leading the nation. He feels the task, the the weight of a complaining people that are so quick to turn from the Lord. And I want to tell you, church, we're not that much different. Sometimes preachers and teachers will mock the people of Israel, but we're so often when times of trouble show up, when hardship shows up, we're quick to turn our back to God and turn ourselves to drugs for comfort. We're turned to turn ourselves to alcohol, to sex, to pornography, whatever it might be. We're quick to turn our backs to God and find a different source of comfort. Moses in the struggle begins to pray and cry out to the Lord and God responds to him. Numbers chapter 11 verse 16 says that the Lord answered Moses, bring 70 men from Israel known to you as elders and officers to the people. Take them to the tent of meeting. That's where God met with his people and have them stand there with you. He says this, then I will come down and speak with you there. I will take some of my spirits who is on you, and I will put that on them. They will help you bear the burden of the people so that you will not have to bear it by yourself. Church family, I want you to know that that still stands today. God may anoint a preacher. God may anoint a pastor. God may anoint a prophet or an evangelist. But we need men and women full of the anointing of the Holy Spirit to stand with the leaders of the church. So the burden of the church, the the, the challenges of the church, the battle that's on the church's lives will not overcome us. We need men and women of God who will stand with Pastor John, Pastor Teresa, Pastor Ryan, myself, Quincy, who will stand and pray and intercede because our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against spiritual powers in the heavenly places. We see that Samson had moments where he was supernaturally empowered by the Lord. Judges 14.6 says that the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him and he tore a lion apart with his bare hands. Deborah was a woman of God and anointed as a prophetess to lead the nation of Israel. In 1 Chronicles 21.26, David, it says David made an altar to the Lord. He called upon God and God answered him in heaven by fire and fire consumed the offering. In 2 Chronicles 7, 1, Solomon, David's son, did the same exact thing. The temple of God was built. He made a great sacrifice unto the Lord. And when he had finished praying, fire from heaven came down and consumed the altar. Elijah squared off against Ahab and Jezebel. Several weeks ago, I did a a little study about who Ahab was. He was a wicked man. And who Jezebel was, she was a controlling wife. Elijah squared off against them in the 400 prophets of Baal. And when Elijah prayed, fire came down from heaven. It didn't just come down, but it consumed the entire offering. What happened on Mount Carmel was so powerful, church. I want you to hear this. It was so powerful. It was undeniable. It turned a whole nation back to God. They experienced a visible, powerful, tangible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. 
The same fire that fell on David's altar. The same fire that fell on Solomon's offering. The same fire that fell on Mount Carmel. The same Holy Ghost fire that fell on Pentecost. The same Holy Ghost fire that fell at Cornelius' house. Every instance in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it was visible. It was tangible. It was undeniable. It was the power of God. And what concerns me today, church, is that as a nation and in the world, we are raising up a generation of Christians that have never encountered, they have never experienced, they've never had a tangible, undeniable manifestation of the power of God in their life. They understand God in theory. They know God in religion. They know about God mentally and intellectually, but they've never had a Mount Carmel experience. They've never had a Day of Pentecost experience. They've never had a Cornelius House experience. They never had a burning bush experience. They never had the Holy Ghost seize them and take control and and just empower them and speak to them in such a way that's undeniable. They've never experienced the burning power of the Holy Ghost when he anoints a person to pray for the sick and see them well. There was a pastor that I spent my four years of Bible college under, Pastor Wayne Shirk in Boston, and the Lord moved in him in such a powerful way. He's still ministering the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The God would speak to him and give him words and knowledge, and he would begin to call out sicknesses from the pulpit, and people would come up, and God, he would just lay hands on them, and they would be healed. God is still operating this way today. God is still working through people today. I I read a biography about John G. Lake, a powerful preacher and speaker and evangelist, but he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He led powerful healing crusades and healing ministries, and they actually did a scientific study. He had bacteria and things on his hand, but when the anointing would come down, when the power of God would come down, When the ministry of the Holy Spirit would come down, diseases would die in his hand. The Holy Spirit is not a suggestion. The Holy Spirit is not a suggestion. The Holy Spirit is necessary for his church. So many people today in this generation view the fire of God as just a concept. It's just an idea of the past. But I came on an assignment to tell you this. The fire of God is not a philosophy to be studied. It's not a figment of an overactive imagination or rambling of religious teachers or leaders. But the fire of God is the person and power of the Holy Spirit. He is the third person of the Godhead. He is the might and power in the presence of God. He is the same fire that fell on Mount Carmel. He is the same fire that consumed Jesus' ministry. He is the same fire that fell on the day of Pentecost. He is the same fire that fell at Cornelius' house. The fire of God is real. The fire of God God is tangible. The fire of God is alive. The fire of God is contagious. And the fire of God is power. <laughs> Jennifer and I took a few years away from Morningstar. And in that time, I, I was studying different things like medicine and different things like that. And I will tell you this about medicine. Medicine does not have the power to heal. I had to take this test where I had to learn 400 different drugs, their side effects, what they're used for, all that stuff. Man, that was like mind-blowing. But I passed, praise Jesus. (laughs) But here's what I want to tell you. Medicine does not have the power to heal. Because for everything we take in our bodies, every medicine we, we take and ingest, what happens is there's a side effect. When somebody is diagnosed with cancer, doctors do not have the power to heal. Doctors have the power to prescribe chemo, but chemo will also destroy the body. Doctors have the ability to go in and do surgery and cut out the the, the tumor or the cancer or whatever it may be, but they do not have the power to heal because it will leave a scar or a side effect or something will be missing. The power of God is the only thing that can cure a disease, that can heal a disease, that has no side effects. It's the fire of God that can burn up 
drugs in your system and desire all at the same time. It's the fire of God that can restore missing body parts. It's the fire of God that can deliver you from drugs, alcohol, lust, pornography, perversions. It's the fire of God that burns up jealousy, pride, criticism, bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness. It's the fire of God that can heal a broken heart. It will restore joy. It will restore peace. The fire of God has the ability to heal your marriage. The fire of God has the power to heal your mind. You don't have to live in depression. You don't have to live in in subjection to the enemy. The fire of God has the power to restore all things. God who created this universe has the right to override sin that has corrupted and destroyed human bodies, destroyed human will, has destroyed spirits. Those who are bound by demonic spirits, when Jesus showed up, he carried the anointing, he carried the fire of God. The demons would cry out and say, Have you come to torture us? Have you come in this moment to judge us? Have you come in this moment to punish us? They understood what the anointing would bring. See, it's the anointing that has the power to set people free. The anointing of Jesus breaks every yoke of bondage. And my prayer for today is this. God, do it again. God, let your fire fall. Let the same fire that fell on Pentecost fall on us today. And today our big idea is this, that the same power, the same fire that Jesus promised to the disciples is available for you and I. God doesn't play favorites. God doesn't just select Jews and ignore Gentiles. God doesn't just save whites and ignores black. God doesn't just save blacks and ignores white. God is no respecter of person. So today, church family, I want to give you three ways that we can prepare our hearts to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Our first point today is this. Number one, we have to accept that the gift is available today. We read earlier Moses' story that he felt overwhelmed and crushed and worried about the future, that the needs were so great. So I want to take you back to that story. This This is something Jesus showed me years ago. I've never heard it preached on. That doesn't mean it's a a, a secret knowledge, but I believe something that God wants to bring this to light. Numbers chapter 11, verse 28 through 29. This event takes shortly after God pours out his spirit on all people, and Moses is having a conversation with Joshua, the next ruler of Israel. And Joshua, son of Nun, assistant of Moses, since his youth responded to Moses, my Lord, stop them. Stop them. For those of you who don't know, when God poured out his spirit on those 70 leaders, they began to prophesy and people would flock them. And Joshua says, stop them from doing that. I I see Joshua in his youth, he's saying, man, if they start prophesying, if they start declaring from God, if they can hear from God just like you, Moses, they're going to leave you and turn to others. But this was Moses' response. But Moses asked him, are you jealous on my account? If only... All, listen, look at this, underline this. If only all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would place his spirit on all of them. Then Moses returned to camp along with the elders of Israel. I want you to take note of that. Moses said, if only all, if only all of the Lord's people were prophets, if only God would place his spirit on all of them. In your notes or in your Bibles, you can turn to Joel chapter two, verse 28. And Joel has a prophecy from the Lord. He's a prophet, and he says this, that after this, he's saying, God, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams, and your young men will see visions. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 says this, while he was with them, he commanded them not to leave. This is Jesus talking. He commanded his disciples not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. He said, you have heard me speak about John's baptism, but with water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1-8, Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, until the ends of the earth. I want to challenge you, church. God has really impacted my theology on this. 
I had an interview with a young man who's going into ministry. Well, I guess he's not that young anymore. But he's going into ministry, he's taking tests, and he's asking me about the theology of the Holy Spirit. Two weeks ago, I would have said, you know what, in a practical sense, if somebody accepts Jesus, they have the Holy Spirit, because Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit is evidence of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control. But I want to challenge you, church, as I was studying this, think about this. The disciples love Jesus. The disciples had Jesus. The disciples wanted to follow Jesus. They, they worshiped him. They acknowledged him as God. But even in all of that, Jesus said, wait for the Holy Spirit. You don't have him yet. They needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not enough just to make a prayer. We need to be fully immersed and baptized in his power. Here's what I want to show you, church. Moses had a relationship with the Lord. He walked with the Lord. He knew the Lord. And in Numbers chapter 11, we see that Moses is sharing his heart with Joshua. He said that I wish all of God's people were prophets and God would place his spirit on everybody. God was listening. God was listening. I want you to understand, church, never us underestimate the power of your relationship with the Lord. Many times we think that prayer is the only way we communicate with God. Moses was talking to his assistant, but God was listening. Moses' request became Joel's prophecy that God would pour out his spirit on all of humanity, that everyone would prophesy. And Joel's prophecy became our promise that the Lord in Acts chapter 2 began to pour out his spirit on the day of Pentecost. And sons and daughters began to prophesy. They began to speak in new tongues. Jesus promised new power. I want you, church, to understand, never underestimate your relationship with the Lord. Moses wasn't even praying, but God was listening. Your prayer. Prayers have the power to outlive your life and impact generations to come. Never stop praying. Never stop believing. Never stop seeking. The Lord is listening. Church family, the Bible teaches that life and death is in the power of the tongue. Moses spoke life. I wish every person could experience God the way I have. I wish every person would experience his presence and his power and walk with the Lord just as I had. And we forget that God is listening. Church family, I don't want you to give up praying for lost loved ones who are far from the Lord. Your prayers have the power to outlive your life. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And church family, we need to go back to learning to praying scripture. You see, the word of God, when it goes forth, it will not return void. You are Some of the things you can pray when you're going through a hard time, Father, I thank you that your word declares that I am the head and not the tail. God, I thank you, Lord, that you have promised to be faithful to not only me, but my generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. God, I thank you that your will is that none would perish, but all would come back to repentance. So, Lord, I pray right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would give Get a hold of my son, that you would get a hold of my daughter, that you would get a hold of my family, that you would get a hold of my loved ones. And Lord, I pray right now that your will be done. You see, there's power in your relationship with the Lord. Moses was not even praying. God, I thank you right now that your word declares by your stripes we are healed. God, I thank you right now that you have the power to kill every disease in my body. Lord, I thank you that the anointing of the Holy Spirit was not just for years past, but it is for today. That we can draw on him, we can call on him, we can intercede, we can pray, we can fast, and we can experience the miraculous today. Jesus said that you will receive power. Jesus declared that these signs will follow those that believe, that they will lay their hands on the sick and they will be well, that they will prophesy, that they will cast out demons. Jesus made these promise. You see, it's the same power 
that caused the sun and the moon to stand still in Joshua's day. It's the same power that divided the Red Sea when Moses was leading the people out of Israel. It's the same water that forced, it's the same power that forced water to come out of a rock. It's the same power that made Hebrew children fireproof in a fiery furnace. God gave Daniel's lions lockjaw so they couldn't devour him. That same power shook the jail and set Paul and Silas free. That same power was upon Jesus' life that opened the eyes of the blind, that unstopped deaf ears, that made the lame to walk and made the dumb to talk. This same power raised Jesus from the dead. And this same power, this same anointing, God wants to send it on your life today. God wants to fall on every person hearing the word. Remember, Peter was just preaching and the anointing came. God wants to fall on your life in a tangible, undeniable, irrefutable, indisputable way, a manifestation that can only be attributed to the power and the presence of God. But church family, we need to understand this, that it is a gift. The Holy Spirit is a promise, but it is a gift. Just like salvation is a gift, just like Christmas Day you receive gifts, church family, you have the power to reject the gift. You have the power to say, this is not for me. You have the power to say, I want no part of this. You have the power to say, this is not the gift that I want. This is not the gift that I thought. You can reject the anointing of God in your life. God has made it available for you. He paid it through his precious son. He's made you right in relationship with the Lord. He promised the Holy Spirit on your life. You can reject his gifts by the way you think, by the way you talk, by the way you walk. It's up to you. Number two, my first point is, number one, God has made this promise for everybody. Number two, I wanna teach you that hunger draws the anointing on your life. Hunger will open doors for the manifestation and the power of God. Am I talking to anybody who's hungry today? Am I talking to anybody who's thirsty today? Am I talking to anybody who wants a real, tangible manifestation of the anointing of God in their life? Am I talking to anybody who's not just satisfied with religion and tradition and practices in country club? Is there anybody today who hungers for a day of Pentecost, who's hungering for an anointing, who's hungering for the power of God, who's hungering to see something healed, who's hungering to see children come back to the Lord? Am I talking to anybody hungry today? Smith Wigglesworth, many of you guys may not know him. He was a great preacher. Actually, he was a terrible preacher in London. <laughs> His wife out-preached him. But what changed their ministry was the anointing of God came on his life. She would often preach services for him, but the anointing was on this man. And when people would come up, sick people would get healed. There's many accounts of Smith Wigglesworth praying for dead people who have passed and they come to life in that moment. And this is what he had to say. He said, the secret of spiritual success is a hunger that persists. It's an awful condition when a Christian comes to a place where they're happy where they're at in their spiritual walk. God was and is always looking for hungry and thirsty people. Smith Wigglesworth also said this, that every soul touched by Pentecost, touched by the anointing, touched by the Holy Spirit should be a live wire. I'm not an electrician, but I understand working on a camper, a live wire is something that's always active. It's always powerful. It's always enabling. It brings life to something else, but it can also shock you if it's not used the right way. He said every Christian, when they've been touched by Pentecost, when they've been touched by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, they are a live wire. I think of Jesus and the woman with the blood issue. I've brought that up several times, but this one just stands out. She pressed through the crowd, and she didn't even touch his body. She touched his clothes, and instantly healing went out and healed her. I think of Peter when he was walking with the anointing. We'll read later in Acts that even as he was walking in the streets, his shadow would begin to touch people and they would be healed. Oftentimes in church, we're comfortable preaching about how God separated the waters, how God healed the sick, how Jesus did this. But when we say it's here and available for today, we send a shy away. I want to remind you of this, that 
Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for he shall be healed. John G. Lake, another great evangelist, I saved, shared this with our team this morning, another great evangelist walked in the anointing of God. He'd preach crusades and people would get saved and people would get healed. And they ran a science experiment on him where there was like bacteria and different things on his hand. But when he would begin to pray, when he'd begin to seek the Lord, the anointing fell on him and these diseases, this bacteria died in his hands. The anointing of God is real. The anointing of God is powerful. Reinhard Bonnke recently passed away into glory, but he was somebody who was very influential in my life when I began seeking the Lord in Bible college, and he would leave massive crusades all throughout Africa and different parts of the world, and as he was just praising God, he would just give a shout, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. And it was recorded that those who came on crutches and those who came in wheelchairs were instantly healed in the power of Jesus' name. <laughs> Psalms 42.2 says that my soul, my soul, David writing, my soul thirsts. I'm parched. I need the living God. Psalms 107.9 says, for he satisfies the longing of my soul, my hungry soul with all God's things. John 4.14 4, says, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become a spring, a well sparing up to eternity. Revelation 21.6 said, he said unto me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And to the thirsty, I will give from him the spring of water without payment. He's saying there's nothing you have to do. The promises of God, you don't have to fast for it. You don't have to give a special offering for it. You don't have to present a love offering to receive a miracle today. Jesus says, are you hungry? Is there an inner desire to want more? And I believe that today there are some hungry people as we're preaching this word. They refuse to be satisfied with passive, powerless, pointless Christianity that churches have made into country clubs. There are some hungry people that as they hear stories from the Bible, as they're hearing the promises of Scripture, as they're hearing stories about people in our current day, they say, I want that, I want to catch that fire, and I believe God will touch you today. God's anointing is an all-consuming fire. Today I want to turn your attention to this Fancy object lesson. There's a picture on the screen if you can't see it, but I'm using this TV to help me teach and demonstrate. This diagram is a rough representation of the Temple of Solomon. Okay, so I didn't add all the different details in there. I didn't want to confuse you. I didn't want to get you bogged down with everything here. But here's what I want to tell you. Once a year, back in the Old Testament, only one person could enter the Holy of Holies. Only one person could experience the presence and the power of God. And it was the high priest who went through many different traditions and sacrifices and rituals to come before the Lord. And if he was found unworthy, God would strike him dead here. And the priest would have a rope tied around his leg and they'd have to drag him out. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, it said the veil that separated the holy of holies was torn in two. Praise God he's not dropping people dead but you're covered by the blood of Jesus. The presence of God is not reserved for one person. The presence of God is not reserved for one preacher. The presence of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is not for somebody who's super special or whatever. The presence of God rushed from the Holy of Holies and was made available to all of us. That's what we're seeing in Acts chapter 10. But here's what I wanna teach you. In this diagram, there's, there's the Gentile court. You can see that at the top here. That's where all the non-Jewish people, that's where they were allowed to go. They couldn't go any further. We see that there, here was the court of Israel. This is primarily where women and children were found. And here, in a smaller section, we have the court of men. Because God viewed it in different roles. I'm not getting into all that. <laughs> It'll get me off track. <laughs> but here's what I want to show you. God is asking, are there any people hungry? 
You see, in order to move from the court of Israel and into the court of men, there has to be a hunger. It gets smaller, right? The noise is on the outer court. That's, that's when we come together and we worship the Lord. That's, that's usually the intro song in our worship. It's loud, it's vocal, it's praise, it's good. It's easy to be on the outer court because that's where there's energy. That's where there's hype. That's where there's a crowd. But if I'm hungering for the Lord, I'm gonna need to move myself from the outer court and move myself into the inner courts here. And in order for me to move from the outer court and move into the inner court, that means some relationships may need to be let go. That means some patterns in my life need to be let go. That means some habits in my life may need to be let go. Because when we move from the outer courts and we move to the inner courts, it gets smaller. And when we want to move from the inner courts and get into the presence of God, it gets smaller. The closer we get with Jesus, the more intimate we get with Jesus, God begins to separate some people who are weighing us down. That doesn't mean that the people who want to stay in the court of Israel are wrong. It doesn't mean they're not saved. It doesn't mean they're not blessed by the Lord. It just means they have a different hunger than you. And if I want to experience everything God has for me, I need to be willing to let some things go and start walking deeper and deeper, and deeper. That's why it's so important to understand the relationships that you have in this life. They will determine your attitude, and they will determine your altitude. God, I love, I love my dad. He always said this. God has called us to be eagle Christians and sore, so stop hanging out with the chickens. God has put a calling so big on your life, he's called you to soar. He's called you to rise. It's easy to hang out with chickens because they're stupid and they're fat and they can't really fly. It's easy, it's easy to hang out with chickens because you look good among them. It's easy to hang out with people who do not have a hunger and thirst for righteousness because it makes you feel self-justified that, well, I'm walking with the Lord, I'm good. Church family, God has called you to soar. God has called you to fly. God has called you to walk in a supernatural anointing. He hasn't called you to live an ordinary life. John G. Lake also said this. He said that if I were to stay in the realm of reason, if I were to just limit my Christian walk to the realm of reason, then I live in the devil's playground. But if I'm willing to embrace and believe that all Jesus has for me, that's when the devil gets afraid. My question for you today, church, is how much of Jesus do you want? How much of God's presence do you want? Are you willing to let go of some things to move closer to him? Are you willing to let go of some things to move into that holy place? Are you willing to give up some addictions, some patterns, some behaviors in order to experience all that God has for you? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just to give you a new spiritual language. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, God said, was to empower you to be a witness. Its primary purpose is power. So number one, to prepare my heart for the Holy Spirit, I need to acknowledge it is for today. Number two, there is a hunger that has to creep up inside of me to thirst for more. Number three, I love this one. Jesus said to ask and wait. Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says this. He says, ask and you will receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call unto me and I will answer you and show you the great and mighty things that you do not yet know. One thing that I've learned in my own search for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in my life is that God has an anointed time and he has an appointed time. Let me explain. For David, he was anointed to be king over Israel. But it wasn't until many years later that the appointed time came and God elevated him into that kingship. For the disciples, they were told that they would receive power, but they had to wait. God is in the details. 
As the disciples were waiting, as the disciples were praying, the Feast of Festivals was coming together. The Table of Pentecost was coming together. God was drawing nations to Jerusalem so that at the appointed time of power, the Holy Spirit would be poured out and have a maximum impact. God is in the details. There is an anointed time where God delivers you a promise, where he delivers you a word, where he delivers you a blessing, and there is an appointed time for the manifestation of God's power to be released. There are some of you sitting here today and you're like, man, I had a word from God and I haven't seen it yet. Do not give up. Pray that scripture through. Pray that promise through. There is an anointed time and there is a appointed time time. So what do we do in the midst of waiting? We seek the Lord. We build intimacy with him. We press into the holy of holies. And some of you, you you may have struggled with this teaching. Some of you may have struggled with teaching in the past about the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And many pastors today, I was reading an AG statistic, the baptism of the Holy Spirit has started to plummet in our churches. And I believe it's because pastors are afraid to preach. We're afraid to preach on divine healing so we don't see healings happen. We're afraid to preach about salvation so nobody comes to Jesus. We're afraid to teach that baptism should happen for all believers and people are not getting water baptized. And we're afraid to preach about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because what if he doesn't show up? I'm gonna tell you, I had those same exact thoughts. God, what if I preach on this? This is your word. I trust it. I believe it with my whole heart. I am baptized in your spirit. I speak in tongues. But what if I preach and nothing happens? And the Lord reminded me, your job is to build the altar. Your job is to deliver the word. Your job is to prepare hearts. Jesus's job is to baptize them in fire. I want to share with you real quick just so this becomes tangible and relatable. When I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, it was after my first missions trip. I was home and I was seeking the Lord and God did an awesome thing. I worked as a Spanish translator at the time. I couldn't do it again now if I wanted to. That was many, many years ago. But we preached the gospel. We built homes. We built churches. We built schools. It was a lot we were doing and I was hungry after the Lord and I was in my own private prayer time and I struggled with this. I've been to many altar calls. I've been to many special services. I've been to many youth conventions where they were praying over the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I had big evangelists that are still preaching to today who move in signs, wonders, and miracles, lay hands on me, and nothing would seem to happen. And I was discouraged, but I believed it was real, and God had something for me. And the Lord, in my private prayer life, took me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and Paul wrote this. He said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Paul, one of the arguably greatest apostles, declared, I speak in tongues more than any of you. And there's more that he wrote there. But I want to tell you, as somebody who was seeking God, all it took was that verse. And I said, Lord, if he said he needed it, if he said he was thankful for it, if he was hungry for it, God, I need this. And it was in that time of intimacy with the Lord, I continued to pray. I continued to seek God. I continued to ask him and say, Lord, I need this Pour it out on me. And then I took a moment to be quiet. And it happened. I want to tell you, church, sometimes we think that God in his supernatural, when a miracle happens, we, we watch a lot of TV, we think a bright light should take place and a miracle should show up, and that's just not always the case. For my personal story, what ended up happening was words started coming to my mind. There were thoughts coming into my mind. There was a doubt, and it didn't make sense. And I said, God, is this real? And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and he said, son, you've been praying for this. You've been seeking this. Do not let Satan rob you of the gift I want to give you. Speak it out. And as I began to pray in the spirit and I began to use the words that I felt like the Lord was imparting unto me, like I said, in the natural, it didn't make sense. I didn't understand it. 
But God has continued since then to grow it and develop it and strengthen it, and it's been beautiful. There's an intimacy when you pray in a heavenly language that Satan cannot break the code. Satan doesn't know what you pray. The Bible teaches that it's the Holy Spirit who begins to pray through you and speak through you. I may not know what to pray. My English has limitations. I may not know how to intercede on your behalf or pray for your marriage or pray for the loved ones, but when I allow the Holy Spirit to take hold of myself, when I allow the Spirit of God to cry out of me, when I allow God to speak through me, something magical happens. I want to encourage you, church. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. God did creation it says he spoke it into existence what a more powerful thing than to surrender yourself to the spirit of God allowing him to speak things into existence in your life allowing the Holy Spirit to pray things that are not yet here and he draws that supernatural anointing God begins to draw you closer to him but as you lead and yield yourself to the Holy Spirit he begins to bring in his purpose, his power into your life. See, the gift of the Holy Spirit is not just about evangelism, although that is the primary purpose. There's power in it. I pray in tongues every church service. I pray in tongues when there's worship up there and before I get ready to speak, I am interceding because, Lord, I have nothing to give you, but it's the Spirit of God. He's the one who hovers over the waters. He's the one that has something to impart. He's the one that can take take dead things and bring them to life. And as I'm praying and interceding, I see the lion of the tribe of Judah. I say, God, go before me. Go before me. I I have nothing of value to give to your people. But Lord, if the Holy Spirit empowers your word, if the Holy Spirit takes a hold of this service, if the Holy Spirit is the one that is allowed to be released, then an unstoppable God will move to kill cancer. He will move to set people free. Drug addictions will be destroyed in Jesus' name. Loved ones will come back to the faith. God will empower you to be the light he's commanded you to be. If we surrender to him. Church, there's a lot of weird things that come up in Christianity. You know, we teach about virgin births. We teach about a king of the universe who came as a man. He lived a perfect life, died in our place for sins. And we're okay accepting that. But for some reason, we we get hung up on this issue of tongues in spiritual language and baptism, but the same faith that takes you to receive Jesus as your savior, the same faith that takes you to believe God's promises are yes and amen, the same faith that it takes you to trust him with all that you have, that's the same exact faith that it takes to be baptized and anointed by his Holy Spirit. Now I apologize, I know I kept you late today, but we have one service and I believe this was Holy Spirit teaching. So here's, here's some instructions. I'm going to do a general prayer for you. We're going to have a worship song go forward. And, and, you know, in the middle of the worship song, if you're ready to go, you're welcome to go. God bless you. There's pretzels out there for you. We, we'd love for you to partake. Somebody leave me one. <laughs> but if you're sitting here today and you're hungry, You know, we sing the song, we need a fresh wind, a fragrance from heaven, Holy Spirit pour out. If if you want that to be more than words, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit came when God's people were seeking him in prayer. The Holy Spirit came when God's people were sitting sitting under preaching. And the Holy Spirit came when God's people would lay hands on, on them. We've had time of prayer. We've had preaching of the word. Now all that's left is we need to lay hands on people and pray, Holy Spirit, come. 
So if you're here today and you're hungry and God has touched your heart, I want to invite you to come to the altars. We have a prayer team that has been taught. We have a prayer team that has been commissioned. We have a prayer team that has been seeking the Lord this week so you can receive this gift. Now I understand that this altar call, this is not for everybody. If you're content where you are, remember you're in the outer court. You're still Christian. That's okay. Maybe you're not ready to step in and get to Jesus here or get to Jesus here. There's no pressure. But I want to take a time that if you're hungry, if you're ready, if you're searching for more, God has something for you. I close with this word that Smith Wigglesworth said that this, that God has made available everything by his Holy Spirit. He said, I'm not content to live on the plane of an ordinary man, but God has called me to live an extraordinary life. And it's only when I tap into his presence that all of heaven is released here on this earth. So Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it doesn't return void. I thank you that by the power and the presence of your precious Holy Spirit, that you will release a fresh wind today. God, I pray that you bless your people. Let the word sit there. There are those that are hungry and they're ready to be touched now. They're, they're ready, Holy Spirit. There are those that just need a moment to sit and process and think, and that's okay. Lord, I pray that you would use this time for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Church, we're gonna go in one song and then you'll be dismissed. If you want to stay at that dismissal, I ask you come to the altar to the front. We're going to pray for you. But if you're leaving and dismissed, I ask that you take this out, chatter outside of the sanctuary. We want to create an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to move. Amen. Thank you, Jay. So, Lord, that is our prayer. God, again, I pray that you be with your people. Bless them this day, God. I thank you that the Holy Spirit is for here and for now. And, God, as we get ready to enter into prayer, as we begin to seek you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bless us with your outpouring. In Jesus' name. If you're tuning in online, God bless you. We will see you next week. Church family, if you feel led to be dismissed, you are led to dismiss. But if you're hungry today and you're ready, come on up. Come on up.